All right, so both Paul and I kind of came, I came on shortly after he did, and as we were working together in the cemeteries, it really became clear to both of us that there were, there were a lot of stones that were broken and decaying and needed some help. And we weren't sure how to go about it, but we knew it was important that we started preserving some of these stones because the Waitley cemeteries help us maintain a sense of our history um, the cemeteries are a resource for us, for Civil War soldiers, Revolutionary War soldiers, for Korean War, Vietnam War, all those soldiers' markers, and many of them were in pretty bad shape, or are. Um, as the stones fall and crumble to the ground and sink into the ground, they start to lose their marking. You can't read it anymore. Um, so we felt like we wanted to try to preserve that history. Um, we have three cemeteries. We have Center Cemetery, which is our oldest. Uh, the oldest recorded stone dating on that is 1762. The next one, the next oldest is East Cemetery, and the oldest stone there is 1772, 10 years later. Uh, and then West is the youngest one, and that's the, uh, the oldest stone is 1776. Um, so, you know, not only do they mark the soldiers and, and, but, and the deaths, but it also will, if you follow through and walk through the cemeteries, you can learn about births, you can learn about marriages, you can learn about illnesses. All kinds of stories go on on these stones, and we wanted to make sure that we started to save the ones that were decaying on us. Um, uh, on top of the, preserving the history, it also is a problem for us in terms of the groundskeeping. In, when the stones are down, we can't just run down the rows mowing the lawn. We have to go around each one of the stones, and then we have to trim around each one of the stones that's on the ground. A lot of the stones have been run over by cars. They're getting crumbled as they turn corners on the roads. Um, and then the other important piece is safety. Several of the stones are leaning really severely, and I think we were both worried about people playing around the stones or visiting. and checking out stone that's can working your hard and it falling on them. So we wanted to try to take care of that and neither one of us really knew anything about how to how to do some of that. Um, so trying to make it easy. If you could yeah. Oh. yeah. So this these are some of our broken stones. Um, this one was in Center Cemetery uh, and that leaning every time I went around that with the lawnmower I thought this is the time it's gonna land on me as I go by. This was a Civil War marker in East Cemetery, and this was a marker in, uh, I believe that's in Center, that was just sinking and disappearing into the ground. Uh, sorry for the terrible photos. These are all coming from our restorer who doesn't take the best photos ever. Um, so we began to research what was involved in terms of how to prepare, how to preserve and repair these stones. Uh, and so it led us to taking a couple of workshops. Paul took one before me, and then we took one together. And that's your turn. He's going to tell you about it. Yeah. You I need to get where the camera is. Paul, Paul, come on over here. There you go. Yeah, you're going to be staring at the screen. Back about the time that I retired, I was looking for something to do and somebody heard about it uh, and I've been involved with it for, for the cemeteries for six years now. One of the first things that was quite interesting for me was Fred Oakley from Hadley was a gentleman that was well versed in the restoration of stones uh, and through, through the efforts of the uh, Historical Society, Fred came to Quaitley and uh, spent several hours or several days showing us how the proper way, to, first of all, to identify them, then to decide how they are going to be restored, and then he showed us, the, now we're talking stones that have snapped off at the base, and when they fell, rear tablet like that, like that and like this, broken right through. So he showed us how to join them together with the, the use of uh, 
brass pins. They don't use steel pins because they rust or they break down. And he used an epoxy. He allowed it to set for, say, two days. It was well set. And then when he showed us how to set these stones back up, hmm. picture something that's probably a couple of hundred pounds. And he showed us safely how for, for two people, one on either side, to stand that up. We would brace it, and he would let it set for another two days before we backfilled it. And I look at those stones today, uh, most of those stones that we reset five, six years ago are still standing. It, the, detail, the detail of working with stones, the first thing that everybody gets impressed upon them is to take and to do it safely. Because if you had a problem with one of those stones, it would be a real problem. The, uh, after, after, after that, the next project that came along that was available to Darcy and I was in Greenfield. They had a workshop up there, and for those of you that travel up through Greenfield on the main road, this cemetery is what, probably a quarter and a half a mile <coughs> from the center, and badly in need of restoration work. And I, I don't recall, who was the group that came down, who was the gentleman that came down and uh, worked with us here? I don't, or was it a... Uh, Graven, Graves? Uh, that. <laughs> I'm forgetting, I should have brought that with me. Yeah. Well, that's all right, I forget stuff too, yeah. so. Uh, the important thing was, that it was like, it was like the next step in, in working these monuments. The farther down the road you go, it seems like the bigger they get, the heavier they are, and the more techniques you have to have really uh, down pat, up down pat. Greenfield Community College was the uh, was the sponsor for this gentleman, and I think we spent I think we spent two days there, one day and then a follow up the following day, and uh, some of those stones are still standing, and they are on the hillside and there is also vandalism. Fred, Fred had a good sense of humor, and uh, <laughs> I, I, most of you folks that know me know that there's always a tale to go along with the dog. And uh, Fred, Fred was pointing out that on some of these tablets, below the ground level, if they were sitting like that much below the ground level, the, these engravers, had a sense of humor, apparently, because they would put cartoons on the bottom of, of the tablet. It was buried, nobody saw it. I think it sounds like good advertising to me. But, uh, that, uh, and, and at that point, I'm going to flip it back to Dashie and let her pick up. OK. so. After we both attended that course and took a look at all the stones that were broken or fallen or leaning, we realized it was far too much work for the two of us to take on by ourselves. So we started digging around into what we needed to do to get help to do that. And in the process, I came in contact with the Massachusetts uh, Department of Conservation's Historic Cemetery Preservation Initiative and talked to them for quite a bit. And they informed me that it was best to have a, a professional conservator to be dealing with the historical stones. That's what's recommended by the state. So that led us to the realization that we needed to look into hiring a professional to take care of the stones. Um, Paul and I both do as we go along and are taking care of the, the the cemeteries, we will reset or place the smaller stones back into their bases because it doesn't take much to do that. Um, we'll also clean stones here and there as we go to get some of the lichen off of it or wash them down. Um, so I can show you, this is an example of one that I said as I was mowing. I just stopped and, and took time. These two are both very small little stones, so it doesn't take much to clear them away and straighten them back out and put them back in place. Um, so, and a lot of the small 
markers around family plots are about this big and they tip out of their bases all the time. And that doesn't take much to pop those back in and it saves us a lot of time in terms of mowing and cleaning around the stones. Um, so, as I said, it led us to the conclusion that we needed some help. Uh, and it was right around the time that we were figuring this out that uh, the, this, the CPA funds had come through or shortly before that. And so we applied for our first grant for a master plan to be developed to see what the extent of the damage was and to take inventory of what needed to be repaired. Um, and needless to say, that master plan was overwhelming. Um, it, 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 the, so we hired Graves, uh, New England Gravestone Services, uh, um, and, for, and his name is Kai Nalens, and he's out of New Hampshire, I think. <laughs> And he came down to do the master plan, and what he did was he took photos of all, he went through row by row, kind of labeled each row as he went with each one of the cemeteries, and took photos of all the stones that he felt like he needed care, and he prioritized them in order one, two, and three. So one was being the worst, broken, falling, really needing to be repaired or we're gonna lose the stone. Two was on its way to being priority number one, and three was, you know, like it needed some, it was leaning or needed some care, uh, cleaning. Um, so he spent a lot of time laying that all out for us and gave us a disc with all the photos and all the stones. Um, and in the end, we had 206 uh, priority one and two stones for center cemetery alone, 109 priority one and two stones for east cemetery, and uh, 227 priority one and two stones for West Cemetery. So there was a lot of stones to be taken care of. Um, and his estimated work, the high estimate, which was beyond what he would, he knew, he knows there are big companies out there that bid high, and he thought their high estimate would be around $215,000 to do all the work. So <laughs> it's like, whew, okay. Um, so when we approached CPA, we, you know, we were advised to break it down into smaller increments is what we started with. So the first year we got, oh, so I was gonna show you, yes, a picture of this is the, one of the Civil War stones uh, here that is leaning and needed care. Um, so this is leading me to the grant, the first grant that we got, which was, uh, we got 15,000 to start with the CPA funds. And on top of that, Judy informed me of a grant that was out there from the, I have to read this one because it's a really long one, the Massachusetts 150th and uh, sesquicentennial, I forget, <laughs> Civil War Anniversary Commission. Um, and they were giving out grants for preserving anything related to Civil War soldiers. So I got a grant for $4,000 to earmark just for Civil War stones. Um, um, and that allowed, and it, interestingly enough, as I went through all the cemeteries trying to find all the Civil War stones that I could, most of them were in West Cemetery, which I was quite surprised by. I thought there was gonna be a lot more in the West, and there was one pretty badly damaged one uh, in the east. Um, so yeah, that, that so we had $4,000 that allowed us to take care of, in this first batch that happened this past summer, we were able to take care of 14 uh, Civil War markers in West Cemetery, and we took care of one in East. Uh, so this was the before of a Civil War stone in East Cemetery, and this is the after. That stone, ever since I came on, has been <laughs> breaking my heart because you just, I couldn't even figure out how to begin to put that back together. <laughs> so I made sure that he got over to that one this That's first round. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I felt like it was one that was just, pieces were going to keep disappearing from it because it was really crumbling. So I wanted him to get to that right away. Yeah, so you said that's an east? That's an east one. Yep. Do you remember the name of the soldier? I could never read it. I haven't, yeah, so I don't know how legible it is now, but I couldn't ever read it. So I just knew it was from the marker itself. And uh, we, should, we should research it. Yeah, and from some of the the uh, engravings and symbols and symbolism around it, I knew it was a Civil War soldier, but I couldn't really read 
Schools was. Um, so, the remaining CPA funds allowed Kai to, who's the man from New England Gravestone Services, to work row by row. And he, since he did so many up in West Cemetery, he stayed up there and did a few rows. And then we also felt it was important for him to come down to Center Cemetery and be a little more visible and get some of those first few rows done as well. So he was able to get, in the end, 97 stones repaired in the first run, which I think was a lot for the initial amount of money we thought we were looking at. Um, so Paul is going to take over from here and he's going to explain to you, because he spent a lot of time with Kai on site, uh, watching what he did and kind of getting a little more. Come on over here, Paul, let's stand there. I haven't had this much fun <laughs> since I was a teenager. <laughs> this young man came over from Germany. He's probably in his early 40s. He was in the German submarines. And he decided to come to America with his family. He's a one-man band. He shows up on the job. The equipment that he has for doing his work allows him by himself with no other help to take these stones, dismantle them, take them apart, and then reset them. The crane that he has fits, it's about this long, it's about that wide. It's on. And that's, that's a perfectly good example of it. The crane itself is like a big Tonka toy. The whole thing is, uh, it's contr he controls what the crane is doing, but the crane tells him when he's gone too far, he should shorten up on the boom, he should pull in his outriggers, he should put out the outriggers. When he's setting up that crane, that machine is telling him which outrigger to put down so that he levels the machine. Hmm. When when he get gets that level, on on some of the obelisks, like this one in here. Now that's yeah, that's one that's one of them there. Okay, he would hook onto that with a, a protective cable, and he would pick that up. Hmm. Take. And it comes down to here, move it off to one side and set it down, huh. go back, pick the second part of the base up, and move that out of the way. Now here's, here's the humor of the whole project. We had a photographer, we had Darcy, we had myself, and there's Kai, he's going to move the, the the ultimate base of the whole thing, and he looks at it and he says, I can lift that up. <laughs> okay, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah. He reaches down, he gets a hold of that, that base, and the base was probably three by three, and this thick, and he picked it up like that, and he stood it up. And when he stood it up, there were about a dozen mice went. <laughs> and the poor photographer is trying to get away from the mice to still get his picture. Okay? I don't have to read that. I, I remember that. I was crying laughing going home. That, that, everything, everything that he did for us, and he was compensated for doing for us, and above and beyond that, he was educating us on the things that we can do, what's the best way to do them, the materials to work with. Uh, and he did all of this work himself, okay? He had a pickup truck and a little tag on trailer, and when he came onto the site, it looked like the Marines had landed. <laughs> I mean, he, he, I have never been that impressed with a, with a, a professional contracting type of person that performed as well as he did, and nothing was a big deal. Nothing was a problem. Um, 
both to actually and I spent some serious, significant time with them, uh, being a little bit helpful. Maybe I went and got him a cup of coffee. I mean, it, it's the fellow's traveling, and he does Vermont. He does out in New York. He, he serves stuff in Massachusetts. So uh, he's got a passion for doing this. And this is, this is basically what happens when you get involved in it. And that, I've, been, I've enjoyed doing this. I know Darcy has. Uh, and it's like every day is a brand new day. It's always something different. Uh, I'm going to touch on a few things you missed. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm just going to touch on a couple of the other things that he, he would do to repair the stones. When he would take out the obelisk or any of the stones that were in a base, he would remove the base, level the ground very carefully, and use pea stone to get it level. Um, as Paul had noted before, he would make sure that it was perfectly level at the bottom, especially when you're talking about an obelisk, because if it were slightly off by the time you got to the top, it was way off. So he took very good care of making sure that everything was leveled very well. Um, he, with a lot of the stones, that there are several different kinds of stones. So there's the thin slate stones. Those are all one piece straight down into the ground. And when they go way down in, they often would have little ears at the bottom, so I don't know how much that's supposed to help really anchor it, but that's, so those you would just clear away the soil in, in a certain direction to make sure it doesn't fall on you or fall downhill, and you straighten them back out and anchor back in. There are several stones that have bases to them, uh, so they're fit into a groove of a base. So he would take those bases out, clean out those grooves really well, uh, re-level the bases and pop the, the the, the pieces back into the groove. Um, he used what was called a, a light mortar or a soft mortar, so it's softer than the stone, so it would not, the stone would, you know, the mortar would give before the stone did um, to reset those back in place. With the broken slabs, I think we have pictures if you want to bump the next one up. Yeah, so here's, yeah, we have some before and afters. So the broken slabs, he would uh, pop back in place, or he would lay down onto some bedding and, and epoxy it and let it dry and then pop it back up into place. And he uses a, a very particular epoxy that's like the, the National Historical Preservation recommendations for. Um, I can't remember the name of it, I'm sure he, he doesn't either. So uh, some of them would have pins, put into them before for being repaired, and we've learned that the pins, if they're not lead, the pins would cause more problems with the stones because they would contract at different rates than the stone would, and they would also rust. Um, so, and he also took care, I don't know if I have a photo, so let's pop through a few more. So here's one that had a couple pins. These are, these are typical little ones that often we could do as well. He just did them as he went down the row. Um, and we would use the same thing, we would use a soft mortar and just pop them back in place. Um, and we can go another. So here's one that was broken and disappearing into the soil. So he would clear it away. And all of these stones, although they don't look like it at all in the after picture, he would clean with a product called D2. It's a biological cleaner. Uh, and this cleaner, what it does is it basically eats the, the lichen over time, sun and rain helps it do its job. So by this spring, a lot of those stones will be looking white. Um, so yeah, we could go another. Yeah, so here's one that never, it'll, it'll, a lot of them will look like that in the end. That one was down on the ground facing that way. So it never got the lichen or the acid rain on it. Um, but again, that was, so this side was to the ground. And when it's like that, it doesn't get all the acid rain, like eating away at the stone. Um, and again, yeah, we've had, we're not sure exactly who, but someone's been coming through and turning the stones that are down on the ground to see what's written on the other side. So it's a recommendation on our part to people to please leave them alone because it's actually better if they're facing down because the acid rain doesn't eat 
at the writing that's on the tablet. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, so here's one that was, this is a, a slate stone that was starting to pull apart. It's called slaking. Um, so what he does is he fills it in with a soft mortar. There's many ways to do that. Some people will cap them with just a lead cap. But basically, you want to keep the acid rain from getting down in those cracks and pulling them apart. And I don't know how much do we have. Yeah, here's another one, a prime example of oh the difference between the acid rain and the non-acid rain. So had he sprayed something on the bottom part of that? Yeah, it's yeah. You don't notice some differences in spray. Yeah. So well, this is yeah. This is just from being on the ground on the ground and being protected. Right. This is the acid rain, but the browning and streaking is actually from his spray, yeah. and that over time will clear away the rain and sun will clear it off. Yeah. And then, so here's an example of how he would block the the stones as he was letting them dry or helping to move them around. This the the green cloth was what he would use to hook up to his crane to help pick it up. And I think, Harrison, do we yes. have a, a map, so to speak, of the, of the cemetery so that we know plot by plot without people having to try to lift stones? Could they go to a piece of paper and research? We have some maps. They're very spotty. Uh, prior, prior to the like the turn of the century before this, there wasn't any much recording on the maps. Um, so they're spotty, yeah. And it's something actually that we were just talking about. I was talking to a gentleman that Alan knows, Bob Drinkwater. Yeah, we're, we're looking at uh, trying to possibly connect with some, some civil engineer students to actually go stone by stone, record the names, take photos, and start to get us some more comprehensive maps. The other piece that I'm looking into right now is trying to figure out granting or funding for digital software so that we can digitize the maps and that'll digitize all the information on the maps so that we could then just pop up a family name and it'll highlight every place they are on the map or you could pop up vacant lots and it'll highlight all the vacant lots and you know so it'll help us make that easier as it is right now we're pulling out old maps that are you know we have copies of but that are you know seeing better days and we're trying to figure out where people are and then we still have to physically go out to the cemetery and make sure that that's correct with the map and sometimes poke around to see if they're actually where they're safe they're going to be mm -hmm. um, and as we're doing that, we're doing the best we can to write down as much information each time we go to each spot and figure out the information that we get. Yes, here's something to say. Uh, the only thing I was going to mention, that our third commissioner, Jim Duya, had, uh, came on deck with us, what, a couple of years ago? Yep. And uh, Jim has, he's a man of many talents, but he likes mowing grass. And we can accommodate them. <laughs> yeah, he takes care of East Wakeley Forest primarily. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about that second grant for four thousand dollars from for the Civil War stones, uh, is that going to be is that grant available on an annual basis? No, that was just for the one hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the Civil War. Yeah. Um, so I'm. I'm always digging around and hopefully Judy's keeping her eyes up for me because she's pointed me into a lot of directions for those but um, for other grants. Are you approaching uh, for this year more work to be done from yes. the CPA and how much is that are you requesting? Yeah, so we asked for twice as much this year because we really felt like we got far and, it, and on, on, on my part for Kai it felt he comes down with a huge trailer full of stuff and stays at the campground in Waitley and the less he has to haul back and forth I feel like it Actually, the cheaper is going to be for us because I'm sure we pay for the transportation and the back and forth of his equipment. So for him to get here and stay here and get a bunch of dust work done. So we asked for 30000 this year and we were unanimously approved through the CPC. So it goes next March 9th, at 6, goes to the public hearing and then hopefully on to the, the town meeting to be voted in. Is he scheduled to uh, for this coming year? He he's aware that we've been approved, okay. so he's got to wait approval, and then we have to go through yeah. the okay. request for pro for proposals and all of that. It's an open yeah. bid process. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so on the last part of this was a little, uh, Judy had suggested that we give a little recommendations on how to um, take care of your family stones and what you guys can do in your own family plots. Um, we have access to D2, um, so we can spray stones if you find that your stone is really covered with acid rain and lichen and you want someone want us to come take care of that, we can do that. Um, in terms of cleaning it yourself, which I have done at Family Markers and it's just a wonderfully re rewarding thing to do, is you basically need water is the best thing. It's best to go right after a good heavy rain because it's all softened. Um, do I have more on there? Page down. Next one. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, so here's, yeah, this is part of the planting thing. Okay, I thought we went through all the overcorn after. I thought I, put, I forgot to put this on here. So, um, so it's best to do it after rain because uh, it softens everything that's on your stone. And you use just like a nylon brush. Don't use any metal instruments. I've used a toothbrush. I actually often will use an old credit card mm -hmm. because it scrapes away the lichen really nicely and you can, use, you can use the corners of the credit card to get in between the lettering and stuff if you want to get the lichen off of it. Um, and then just you can bring like a small sprayer but no pressure washers because it also, especially if you have a fragile stone, and it will slowly pit, pit away at the stone. So you don't want to do that either. Um, and again, contact us if your stone's like in really bad shape. We'll go out and do what we can, and we can also point the attention to Kai to take a look at it when he's here. Uh, the other part of caring for your family stones is plantings. Uh, we've recently adopted new guidelines for the cemeteries, trying to give some more directions for people in our cemeteries. And we're trying to ask people to stick to annuals if they can. Perennials are, are lovely, but they can get, some of them can get rooty. The roots get underneath the stones and turn them up. Uh, it also can get underneath the stones and work their way in and crack the stones. Um, and they also can overgrow as families don't, you know, stop coming as much. The perennials can take over and then that makes it hard for us to maintain the grounds around it. Uh, and it also makes the overgrowth of a stone creates an environment for lichen and growth on a stone. Um, so this is a case that Kai took care of where there was this huge shrub growing over this monument and we couldn't get around to care for it. So he cleaned up around it, washed it down, and uh, mm. now you can see the whole stone. You can actually get in and see, see all the names, because those often have names all the way around them, if you can't get in there. And this was in West Cemetery. There was a whole front section. We're still working our way through. We've got a lot of work to do, but there's a whole front section of West Cemetery that was overtaken by a lilac that was unattended to. And the stones were being knocked over, um, and you couldn't get in to see a lot of the smaller stones that were in there. So we're slowly working our way through a lot of the neglected plantings. Um, so yeah, if you have perennials, if you have, if they're already there, the best thing you can do is try your best to keep them maintained and trimmed. Um, and again, contact us. If things are overgrown and crazy, we'd be happy to come and help take care of them. Um, and the last thing, our request is to not do any rubbings on the stones. We've learned over time that while it doesn't seem like you're doing much when you're the one person rubbing on it, as people rub over the years and years, these stones are more sensitive than you think in terms of a little bit of salting and slaking off as the acid rain eats on it, it gets it softer, so you keep doing that. And we also, people, we had the stone carvers actually do need to come and do rubbing so that they can match lettering if they need to redo lettering, so we try to save that for when they need to do it. Is there anybody who have any questions? What about the in-ground? I suppose back then there weren't that many of them, but the stones that are in the ground. Caring for those? Or, yeah, I mean, you, you haven't had, as I say, probably back then they didn't have that many. There's actually more than, there are some. There are some, and they, so caring for them, the best you could do is to keep the grass trim around it, and I try my best when I'm mowing the lawns to go and trim around. They'll sometimes stop if they're bad and trim by hand, but often I'll just try to keep it short right around 
the stone. Um, we, Paul has had the occasion several times to go and lift some of those stones because they're sinking to pull them back to the surface. Um, best if you have a stone like that, and we do ask under our, our guidelines to plant them below, just below level so that we don't hit them with the mower and we can go over them. Um, uh, but there's, those are actually fairly easy to take care of. You just want to make sure they stay level. If the soil underneath gets them, you know, funny, just let us know so we can try to strengthen that back up and just keep it trimmed around. And most of those, or many of them, have, well, this, it's this, the, the soldier markers. They have a metal top to them so they don't get eaten as much by the acid rain, but they don't seem to be get as bothered as the upright ones by the acid rain for some reason. I don't know if it just doesn't puddle on them long enough or, or what. Any other questions? Is there, there? Any, anything that can be put on stones to <coughs> prevent them from being damaged by acid rain? Yeah. Not that I know of. What I do know is to just kind of keep them as clean as you possibly can because what it is is that the acid rain, it does eat away anyway on its own, but as it sits on there, it does promote it. Where did they get the material for these stones? They must have been quarried somewhere and trained, brought in by train? Yeah, probably Vermont was a lot of it. There were a lot of quarries up in Vermont. There was several, a lot of it was local. Several were some, here, uh, yeah. A lot of the slate stuff was not uh, was gotten relatively nearby. I'm not sure about the marble ones, the later ones. Yeah, I think those ones. And the oldest ones, ones are, I don't know that we have any the way to the old red sandstone. That he <coughs> yeah. Sandstone? The, old, the oldest ones, yeah. Are there's sandstone. There's a red sandstone yeah. which is really, really soft. Really soft, yeah. There's a lot of them in Hadley. I think that I don't one. think we have in Hadley. Well, I know that one Civil War one might have been. It was pretty that was because this is even older stuff than that. Yeah. This is 16, 17. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. Yeah, good. So the yeah, man, I can't. Bob Drinkwater, that we yeah. were talking about. Bob has, has been doing a lot of research on yeah. where the stones came from and who was carving them. So yeah. he's got. He's working on a book, I think. He is, point. yeah. Apparently at the turn of the, uh, early, well, early Some 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, Whaley was a hotbed of, for stone carvers. Like, this was the place to come to get your stone. We had several stone carvers here. Yeah. Some of them would sign their work. What did they and use after they signed, stopped yes. using sandstone? What's that? What did they use after they stopped using sandstone? They, they moved from sandstone to slate, and then uh, sort of white marble got more popular. White marble. Slate and what? Yeah. White marble. White marble. White marble. <coughs> marble. Yeah. Soft. Well, it's, it's really marble. It's pretty soft stuff. Maybe it's yeah. Yeah, that's marble. yeah, that stuff slakes off. Yeah. There's a lot of white marble where you can see some of the, the like the lettering side of it is just breaking off in pieces. It's it sounds so Victorian. <laughs> so that's what came Sounds from, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cemeteries were changing. Darcy, so. I think you have a handout of that. Yes, yes, I have a handout just of the like the care of the stones. So if anybody wants, I'll just you can just hand them along. It's just like the guidelines. If anybody needs to. So Waitley allows you to plant in and round. Yeah. Fires. Yeah. I annuals. have to say I'm surprised that they move yeah. so many places. You can put a pot and then somebody throws it out. Come right. August right. Or Pots whatever. are always lovely too, but we do love well, annuals. Yeah. 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 Not shrubs. Not, not shrubs. Yeah. That's the thing. It's a, you know it's, you think about years later when you, you're not coming back every week to check on it that it starts to like yeah, overgrow. Yeah. yeah. I'll get you one at home. There. We don't have enough. No, we don't take one. Two of them. Any other questions? Here's one. Yeah. I go to a lot of cemeteries. I see a lot of weed whackers in which contractors go through and then they chew them up. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Uh, you know, we do have to use a weed whacker to some degree, but I try to keep my distance from the stones as best I can. What I would really love to see is everybody to plant time, slow creeping time around all the cemeteries so that we didn't have to. Policy, I say. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, you, they're sort of going with scissors around, you know, you really do have to clean, but we try to use a softer, you know, the contractors have this, you know, like oh, really yeah. bully nylons that they're using, so we try to use a smaller, more so, delicate. So you'd like us to maybe dig around, all the way around the stone, even if we only plant in front? Dig around it? Well, I mean, like, to, to create maybe a stone area of... With pebble yeah. stone or something. Well, I mean, it would protect your stone. If you had something like, there are several stones, especially in Center Cemetery, that have, 
like a, a guard around their stone and they plant within that. And then I just trim around that guard and I'm not hitting the stone. It does protect the stone. I'm I, thinking like I plant in front. Yeah. But you're probably... I'm go. okay if you go all the way around it with planting because that's less of me hitting it with, yeah. you know, I try to tip and use a smaller, softer nylon, but we do have to keep them trim where they... Yeah. Anybody else? If anybody didn't get a handout, um, did you not have enough to do? No, I do, but I have to have more. I can send it to you. Yes. <laughs> Is anybody else short of one? We all good? All right, well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and please, please vote to approve your grant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.